Hello there. This is just a quick video to just explain how to go about interpreting and well understanding really the gate data that you will have connected. Uh, this is a walking gate analysis. This is not from one of the uh, trials that we recorded uh, during your lecture. This is a separate uh, this is a separate trial. This is an old one, basically. Uh, so I won't be giving anything away here by uh, explaining this, going through this with you. So um, there is a lot of commonality between the walking and running data, and uh, I will make a separate video for the running data. But as I say, there's a lot of crossover. So. You begin with this opening page here, which has a series of gate graphs on it. Uh, and the gate graphs are laid out in columns and rows, where each column represents movement in a specific plane of motion. So the leftmost column here represents the sagittal plane. The middle column represents movement in the frontal plane and the column on the right represents movement in the transverse plane of motion. Each row represents either a limb segment or the movement of a joint. So for example here we have a limb segment that is the movement of the pelvis, its rotation in three different planes, the sagittal, the frontal and the transverse. Here we have the acetabulofemoral or hip joint, uh, hip flexion extension in this graph here and hip adduction abduction here and finally hip rotation here. And the trend continues. We've got the knee here, the ankle here, and so on. We also have these two bonus graphs, which I will come on to in a moment. So let's go with, I don't know, we'll go with, oops, zoomed in a bit too much. Yeah. So this graph here on the left-hand side of your screen, the one that you can see the majority of, uh, this represents the pelvic motion in the sagittal plane. Along the y-axis we have the range of motion, which we obviously measure in degrees from 0 to 60. And along the x-axis at the origin here, we have the start of the gait cycle. And at the end here, we have the end of the gait cycle. These vertical lines here represent the transition from the stance to the swing phase for each limb, where red represents the left limb and blue represents the right, for reasons I will never understand. And the thicker lines that you see here represent the actual movement of the pelvis uh, throughout the gait cycle. Uh, and this is an averaged movement of the trials that were performed. So depending on how many trials you perform, this will be an average of those trials. The thicker gray line here represents the normative comparative data here. So what would we say about this? Well, first of all, we need to understand how it was measured. So I'm just going to draw upon one of my future lectures. Um, we measured motion of the pelvis in the sagittal plane, pelvic tilt, by placing a marker on the posterior superior iliac spine here, and the anterior superior iliac spine here. The line between the two is then measured with a horizontal line here which is perpendicular perpendicular with the ground and as we can see this pelvis is tilted slightly forwards and that's the sort of typical natural position of the pelvis which is what we see here so 
the graphs are labeled very well there if you take a bit of time to just study them and look what's being presented on here uh, you'll see that uh, they're well labeled now a this and this is a little this thing to be just mindful of I suppose many of the gate graphs on here will have positive and negative values representing a different type of movement be it in this case flexion positive extension negative so pelvic tilt in the sagittal plane does not have the same uh, format um, it would without there being some sort of severe deformity it would be very difficult for you to truly posteriorly tilt your pelvis but very often uh, in the literature any value below the norm is referred to as posterior pelvic tilt which in a sense is true but it's more accurate to say that there is reduced anterior tilt uh, so there we are so throughout the gait cycle for both limbs for the most part we see a slight reduction in anterior pelvic tilt and that is your first job here it's to spot the difference now do bear in mind that whilst we made every effort to place the markers as accurately as possible uh, your experience is uh, doing this is obviously somewhat limited so the column on the right here requires very specific and very consistent marker placement the transverse plane motion basically so this hip rotation graph here I would instantly look at this and say well that is clearly that's just too out there that's just too far from the normative values um, and there is this constant deviation between the two here uh, between the left and the right side and I think this is just someone's not placed the markers consistently so do bear that in mind the sensitivity of marker placement increases as you move towards the right uh, so if you see graphs like this uh, in fact you can even see it here for the pelvis so here uh, with the transverse plane uh, motion hit pelvic rotation there is a large difference between the left and the right side uh, with pelvic obliquity lateral pelvic tilt there eh, not so much and in the sagittal plane everything's more or less fun I mean, it has to be doesn't it because when you think about it one side of the pelvis can't tilt backwards or forwards without the other side tilting backwards or forwards so it's it it's just a sort of common sense thing so do bear this in mind so but anyway your first job is to spot the difference between your data and the normative data so let's use the reduced anterior pelvic tilt as an example that's something of interest and maybe this knee flexion graph here is increased knee flexion here at the end of the stance phase and obviously into the swing phase and a slight increase in the extension here at the uh, end of the gait cycle uh, there's also what have we got uh, increased ankle inversion here so I'm just randomly picking by the way here I'm not suggesting there's necessarily a link between the two because maybe this person swings their leg a bit more than average uh, however pelvic tilt is strongly associated with ankle inversion and eversion so this is something to be uh, possibly worth noting so your second job is to perhaps or I say perhaps is to compare graphs don't force it then if there's not a reason for the two graphs to be related to each other then don't make one up if you can't find anything in the literature and in your reading then just 
you can hypothesize perhaps but don't just make it up uh, but see if you can find a causative factor between uh, two graphs perhaps the increased inversion is being caused by this reduced anterior pelvic tilt the two graphs at the bottom here uh, the first one on the left the, just ignore these crazy little symbols down here uh, is foot pitch angle um, this is simply a measurement of flat footedness and is taken as a measurement of the uh, marker that was positioned on the calcaneus or just behind the calcaneus um, on obviously on the shoe in your case and on the first metatarsal head and the line that that has the angle that creates with the ground the surface that you're walking on so uh, at initial contact the foot was pitched upwards as one would expect and at the push-off stage uh, we see the opposite of this so uh, not this uh, it's not really one that's worth writing about in too much detail but if you want to you can uh, foot progression angle uh, we've touched on this before but in case you don't remember foot progression angle it's a transverse movement uh, this is from one of my lectures remember it is the line between the second metatarsal head and the line of progression of the person walking so we take the angle here between the two and it is a measure of in towing and out towing and as you can see from this graph if we look at the average data we would expect uh, well everyone does out tow ever so slightly so by around about 15 degrees which is normal so there we are that's fine so this is the average kinematic data for each joint that we've measured on the next page we have joint kinetics and in this case we have joint moments in the if we uh, let me just adjust my screen just focus on these graphs here first uh, these represent the joint moments or torques in the sagittal plane on the left and the frontal plane here in the middle we don't have transverse plane torques and that's fair enough because they, they are tricky to measure and the data is represented as newton meters per kilogram of body weight so again grain lines represent the average and the two but well the blue and the red line represent the limbs of the participant so again we're looking to spot the difference for example here we have an increased plantar flexion moment here at toe off and a reduced dorsiflexion moment here during the loading response i would say phase uh, here and what we could then do is try and link that to the actual joint movement itself so here we have the ankle in greater dorsiflexion than plantar flexion so that could represent the joint just uh, the muscle trying to make more effort to plantar flex and produce a plantar flexion moment at uh, toe off in order to progress the individual forward so again i'm just i'm theorizing here uh, knee extends some moment the knee shouldn't be making too much of a moment here uh, so this is another one that we would perhaps focus in on uh, because again the wrong of the knee really during uh, or the muscles around the knee i should say particularly the quadriceps uh, during the gait cycle is just to maintain the integrity of the tibiofemoral joint you know, they don't really have any propulsive properties so uh, I would 
want to see if I could try and find a reason for this increased uh, knee extensor moment here. So we have a positive moment here. If we zoom in on one graph, oh, again, too much. So let's look at the knee extensor moment. Positive value represents extension. Negative value represents flexion. You could interpret this as the knee extensors and the knee flexors working at specific phases during the gait cycle. So a typical knee moment in the sagittal plane starts with a flexion moment. We actually flex the knee on initial contact in order to just pull ourselves forward. This is followed by a large extensor moment as the knee is straightened out. Uh, this moment then drops down as we just basically balance on top of the joint, um, followed by a small flexor moment here and a second extensor moment here, just to maintain the integrity of the joint before we enter the swing phase here. And this has been marred somewhat, but there is a flexor moment here which represents the eccentric movement of the hamstrings during uh, the end of the swing phase. So just controlling the forward progression of the limb and making sure there's no injury occurring and uh, that there is uh, the appropriate amount of force produced or torque, I should say, produced. So underneath this, we have power, uh, joint power all in the sagittal plane. Uh, hip, knee and ankle, uh, power being the product of, well I should say this is angular power, uh, which is the product of the moment multiplied by the angular velocity of the joint movement. Uh, so as you can see the graphs are broken up into either power generation or power absorption. So whether you're absorbing or generating power uh, and power is the product of work done, which is the product of uh, the total energy in the system. So whether it you could interpret this as saying, well, how much work or how much energy is being produced or absorbed uh, during this time. Below that, we have something that I think you'll be more familiar with. The three grand reaction forces that we would have looked at at level four. So on the left hand side here with the anterior posterior grand reaction force, the medial lateral, and of course the vertical grand reaction force here, which you can certainly add in to your discussion at any point. Uh, just to support anything you might want to say or include, but I wouldn't go mad on these because again, these are that's a topic we covered at level four. So it's not to say you can't include them, but don't go mad. The next set of graphs on page three and page four. Oh, whoops, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, show the same data, the kinetic data here and the kinematic data here, but these are known as consistency graphs. They represent the movement or the rotational force or power for each trial. So we would perhaps be tempted to say if there is a uh, lack of consistency uh, in the movement, as long as we know our markers have been positioned well, that we have an unstable joint. So these can be very, very useful. Uh, this outlier here for knee rotation is just, I would ignore, I would cross that one out. That That's nonsense. That There's no way that would externally rotate that one. That, that's a torn MCL and LCL. Uh, right there. Uh, 
so I would ignore that straight away. Um, but the consistency graphs can certainly be used as a supplementary topic to discuss to show uh, the stability of a joint or the consistency of a movement, depending on what you wish to say. So uh, the you could look at the moment graphs and say, well, okay, they're producing a very inconsistent amount of torque between trials. So there we go. Something can potentially include. And on the final page, after the consistency graphs, because I realize I've waffled on for longer than I thought, we have what we call our spatio-temporal data. Uh, so here is a nice little image of the gate cycle, which you get for free. That's very nice. Uh, we have the measurements of stride length, stride width, step length. So stride length being the distance between the point of initial contact, so heel, and the distance between that point and the following foot strike of the same limb, whereas step length is the distance between the uh, back of the ankle of the foot as it strikes the ground and the distance between the back of the ankle of the foot on the other side, uh, the contralateral limb. Uh, we have stride width, step time, stance time, double limb support time, or initial double limb support time, uh, cadence and walking speed. Uh, again, very much supplementary data here if you wish to include them, uh, but you certainly can. The final thing at the bottom of the graph here, or at the bottom of the document here, is a movement analysis profile, a map. This is you completely unique to Qualysis, uh, and it is where they try to give you an overall comparison of uh, various different movements, uh, so your gait profile score uh, on the left and right limb and overall compared to what would be expected, uh, you, you can ignore this. this. This is just something that Qualysis provides, so uh, there's no need to worry about that. Anyway, I'm going to wrap up there. I hope that's useful, and yeah, keep up the good work.